Well, Chris, uh, first of all, thanks thanks for having me. It's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to just just talk about sort of the the, the heartbeat of my work, and mm-hmm. I tried to put that in a few different books and in, and in this website. Functionalmovement.com started off is an educational resource for exercise and rehabilitation professionals because uh, initially when I first started in, in the field as a physical therapist and a, a fitness slash exercise uh, trainer, strength conditioning coach, I realized that exercise uh, is largely unregulated, mm-hmm. uh, meaning we have many different credentials and it's not a, a bash on the profession. It's a very young profession. So we haven't gone through the necessary evolution that's created the standard operating procedure that we see for pilots in the cockpit or surgeons in the operating room. So a lot of times your exercise choices, uh, if you go to a professional, are largely based on their experience and opinion and not based on statistics or maybe a particular profile Mm -hmm. of how you enter. So I've, I've got this little saying, anytime somebody asks me a question about exercise, the subject of that sentence is not the exercise, it's the individual that it's being prescribed or done to. Yeah. And what we realized is we helped exercise professionals develop a standard operating procedure for exercise profiling. Mm-hmm. If I knew your personality, Chris, I could definitely be one of the most dynamic educational sources in your life because I could tell whether you wanted visual information or auditory information or whether you needed a kinetic experience and you learned by doing. Yeah. Well, how's exercise any different? If I know how you move, Mm -hmm. I'll already know what exercises you need to do and maybe some of them that you may not need to do now because it will just create a situation where you have no choice but to compensate or use poor form. Not because I'm not coaching you well, because you don't have the hip mobility to -hmm. do the drill, even though it looks good and it's something you want to participate in. I need to work you up to that. So functionalmovement.com basically is a holding site that Mm -hmm. promotes movement screening before exercise prescription and and also talks to medical professionals about movement assessment mm-hmm. as we're trying to rehabilitate people. Mm-hmm. And and so it's largely set up as an educational resource for the professional, but we realize so many people would seek us out for self help information who weren't working with the professional. Mm-hmm. And so maybe toward the end of the call we can talk about some self help resources that are on the website as well for those who are, are sort of making up their own program as they go and just looking for for cleaner advice. Well, I'm a I'm a pretty simple country boy from Virginia, so I'm going to I'm going to try to keep it light. I the one thing I can promise you, Chris, is I don't take myself too seriously. So the joint-by-joint joint approach was never even uh, considered a piece of published work. Mm-hmm. And and I didn't even make it popular. Uh, Mike Boyle, uh, a very well-respected strength coach in the States, mm-hmm. made it popular. And it literally came from a conversation in a pub between he and I when we'd been lecturing all day and we were at a conference and we stole a corner in a pub and we'd had a few beers and, and Mike goes, okay, I really get where you're going with the movement screening, but spell it out for me. I'm a strength coach. I'm about getting people stronger and getting people more fit and performing. Spell it out for me. What are the things I need to watch out for? What are the speed bumps that are going to derail an otherwise good program? And I'm like, well, Mike, it goes like this. If I could give your foot a gift, it would be more stability. I want you to have the muscular control to hold your arch in in an advantageous position. Mm-hmm. If I could give your ankle a gift, it would be not to lose the mobility it had when you were three years old. But between the footwear and the high heel shoes and some of the damaging things we do to our feet, we lose ankle mobility. Yeah. If I could give your knee a gift, it would be stability. And if I could give your hip a gift, it would be mobility. If I could give your spine and, and low back a gift, it would once again be stability. And if I could give your upper back a gift, it would then be mobility. And then out to your shoulder, it would be stability. And so what you realize is if you follow my line of thought, Mm -hmm. a joint that largely needs to be stable is paired with a joint that largely needs to be mobile. Mm -hmm. And if I remove mobility from one, I require the other to give up its stability. 
if sure. I give up stability at one, I require the other one to become unnecessarily stiff. Mm -hmm. So when we find areas of sloppiness, say in our core, mm -hmm. or stiffness in our ankles and hips, mm -hmm. the one thing we can't do is take the isolated approach that says, oh, well, just stretch your ankle and all will be good. Well, mm -hmm. on each side of your ankle is a foot and a knee that become very, very sloppy and, and, and very poorly controlled. Mm -hmm. because they've been working around that stiffness. Or if your hip is stiff, your low back becomes sloppy and gives up some of its inherent stability to make up for the range of motion you lack at your hip. So that joint-by-joint -joint approach is not a universal rule. We yeah. can find people who have stiff feet, and we can find people who have sloppy ankles. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, the reason you, you sprain your ankle is not because it's sloppy. It's stiff in one direction, so you roll it in another direction. So it's not a universal or absolute principle, but it's definitely something to keep in the back of your mind yeah. when you want to focus your training program on your knee. I really need to strengthen my knees. Mm -hmm. Are you sure your knees are the problem? Just because they hurt sometimes may not mean you have bad knees. It may mean you got bad ankles and hips and your knee is working overtime yeah. to do all the extra it's got to do just to make up for what you lack yeah. somewhere else. So. The, the, the moral of this story is we've got to train holistically, and when you have pain in your body, the sight of pain may not be the source of dysfunction. Absolutely, and, and you know, the fact that you do work with back pain and the fact that you're king on the hip shows me that you've done your homework mm -hmm. and you've also got a lot of reps helping people. Uh, I don't know if you know who Pavel Setsulin is, but he's the guy yeah. who established the RKC here in the U.S. And he called me one day and said, you know, Gray, everybody else is out there trying to measure the stability of the back yeah. and comment and train and strengthen it. Mm -hmm. He goes, Gray, how do you look at a back clinically? And I said, well, Pavel, I realized in the late 90s, there were very few reliable tests that let me know if someone's back was stable. Yeah. But in the event where I found unnecessary stiffness in the upper back and mm -hmm. unnecessary stiffness in the hips, yeah. I could therefore assume that your low back was not optimized. So I know it sounds like a simplistic approach on, on, the, perp, on, on the surface, but you know, as a physical therapist, I'm actually board certified as an orthopedic specialist. So believe it or not, I do a lot more back pain than you think, and, and mm -hmm. I get a lot of high-profile back cases in professional sports and athletics from the, the professional golf tour mm -hmm. all the way to the National Football League. Yeah. And what I see is if we would not obsess on simply prophylactically strengthening the core, mm -hmm. but we would go through and ask that the hips be a match set yeah. and relatively mobile mm -hmm. and we would ask that the upper back the t-spine and the shoulder girdle be a match set now we know that golfers swing in one direction mm -hmm. and we see different um say asymmetries in their arm and the way they use their hands but you should never see asymmetries in the core you shouldn't see one side of the core being stronger than the other and i think Stu, Stu mcgill comments to that when, when you have a really good side plank on one side not so much on the other that's that's a kiss of death Yep. when you're looking at back stabilization. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to take it one step further. The movement screen and much of my philosophy is based on the fact that the human system is designed to move. And I, I will give you one little pearl to hold on to. Mm -hmm. I've got three children, and they all learn to walk without my help. Yeah. I'm considered a pretty good guy when it comes to movement, and I did not assume that I could speed up that process or make it better. Mm -hmm. They had to roll before they crawled, and they had to crawl before they kneeled. They had to kneel before they squatted, and they had to squat before they stood. Yeah. And so every one of those things required T-spine mobility and authentic hip mobility. Mm -hmm. And when those two things are present, you literally have the neural pathways in your brain and in your spinal cord that create reflexive core stability. So you don't have to supplement core stability 
if you're not abusing your body. You only have to supplement core stability when you're not living like Tarzan. Yeah. Tar- Tarzan could swim, run, climb, and fight. And mm-hmm. he did these things, and he first was free to move. Mm-hmm. And then the activity made him, therefore, functional. And the one thing I want your listeners to know is if you follow the exercise profession, it's going to tail the nutrition profession by about 10 years. Yeah. In nutrition, 10 years ago, it was very popular to live on supplements and eat like crap. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can still eat at McDonald's as long as I take these super supplements and antioxidants. I will by default be healthy. Well, yeah. that's like doing a very, very antiquated exercise program and relying on uh, flexibility and core supplementation. The, 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 the reason I know our exercise programs are largely not holistic is we have to supplement flexibility and core training mm-hmm. consistently. And yeah. so if we're truly on this holistic path for exercise, mm-hmm. then we should really try to find, first of all, corrective movements that yeah. do get you above the cut point. And you don't have to have uh, yoga instructor flexibility to have good hips. Mm-hmm. you just got to have uh, a minimum required amount. And then if you want to choose a sport like golf, we've got enough data to say if you don't have 60 degrees of medial hip rotation, mm-hmm. you're not going to be on the, the tour long because yeah. – you're going to tear up your back. But mm-hmm. if you want to be a uh, triathlete, practice kettlebells, and uh, do a little bit of recreational uh, body weight training, if you've got 25 degrees of medial rotation and about 35 degrees of lateral rotation in your hip, and it's symmetrical, your core is going to do just fine. Mm-hmm. It's only when you go outside of those range of motion requirements that your body will automatically compensate and give you exactly what you asked for because we're built to survive, which means we're built to compromise and, and uh, compensate when we come up with a lack of mobility. So my real uh, approach to getting back in a healthier state is to not so much obsess on the stabilization of the core musculature, mm-hmm. but to make sure I've done my due diligence in making your hips and your upper back mobile. Mm-hmm. And then if your core does not spontaneously reset itself, yeah. with a proper diet of exercise, mm-hmm. then you do have a problem that requires supplementation. Mm-hmm. And if you've had a, a hernia or a C-section or you've had a uh, uh, you know significant arthritis in your spine, then we go to more of the isolated, popular back stabilization things. But largely, I've found that I've been able to stay away from the cookbook stabilization, if you will, mm-hmm. and just get your hips and upper back moving. And believe it or not, the core is designed to reset itself in an optimal environment. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to have telltale signs. A lot of people with poor hip mobility actually don't balance well Mm -hmm. when they're on one leg. So if you can't balance in a very, very stable position, and let's just give the, 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 the listener at home, I mean, if you're a physical therapist, most of the research says if your patients can't balance for 20 seconds in mm-hmm. single leg stance, there's a slight stability issue. If they can't even balance for 10 seconds, there's a significant stability issue. Mm-hmm. We are not to assume that the stability issue is a weakness problem until we demonstrate that mobility is present. If mobility is not present, you don't have the adjustability to make those subtle adjustments in your posture to balance. Because I'm not saying you got to balance 20 seconds like a statue. Mm -hmm. You can make subtle adjustments with your foot, your ankle, your knee, and hip. I just don't want you bobbing your head, dropping your shoulders, and using your torso to manage your balance. Your Mm -hmm. balance should be managed in your lower extremity. And when we see restrictions in the hip, we see poor angles and postures in the pelvis. Mm -hmm. When we see poor angles and postures in the pelvis, we ask you to stand on one foot, and all of a sudden, you stick one shoulder blade in your ear, you contort your neck to one side, you start flailing your arms about as if you're on a rocking ship. Mm -hmm. And that's not balance. That's, I don't know. (laughs) You know, balance balance is poise. Balance is... Mm -hmm. uh, Stand on one foot and don't spill your beer. Or stand on one foot and balance a book on your head. Yeah. And you will make all the adjustments below your waist. A mobile hip mm-hmm. will allow that to happen. So the assumption is 
when we see poor single leg stance, we automatically assume, oh, if your glute medius is not firing and we need to do muscle activation. Mm-hmm. Well, if your hip is not aligned and your pelvis is not level, then the first thing we're asking you to do is, hey, I'm going to give you a balance test in poor alignment. Well, if you're not in optimal alignment, how can you have those resources that allow your vision and your inner ear and your ankle receptors and your knee receptors and your hip receptors to have you keep a level pelvis, level shoulders, Mm -hmm. and a level eye line Mm -hmm. in standing? So the first assumption is when you have poor balance, that it's a strengthening problem. It's Mm -hmm. never, ever a strengthening problem till you remove the mobility issue. Mm -hmm. If you have poor mobility, not only do you have less options to balance, Mm -hmm. but this is my thing. When your mobility is not optimal or it's asymmetrical between sides, then you must realize that your perception is distorted. Or your muscles have as many spindles in them to help you receive information from muscle tension and joint alignment as they do to receive messages about contraction. So the the human muscular system is used equally as a sensory organ and a motor organ. And many times I think trainers and physical therapists uh, forget that if you can't perceive, you can't behave. Mm -hmm. If you cannot perceive correctly, you cannot behave correctly. And the one thing babies enter the world with Mm -hmm. is unrestricted mobility. And Mm -hmm. so their acquisition of movement is largely this rich perception. But if you have a stiff ankle and a stiff hip and you're really stiff in your upper back, and I say balance on one leg, Mm -hmm. you're going to have to use your low back and your knee and cave your knee in and contort your low back to balance. If I assume that's a strengthening problem, then I'm assuming that your perception is normal and you just need to get stronger. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that the majority of those problems you see, these people aren't perceiving the same things you perceive when you stand on one leg. Their options are reduced, so their compensations are increased. We've got, we've got two levels of movement evaluation. Mm -hmm. The first one's a screen and the second one's an assessment. And the best way I can can create that environment for you is when I do your blood pressure, Chris, I can tell if you're hypertensive or not, Mm -hmm. but the blood pressure cuff does not tell me why you're hypertensive. It does, however, categorize you in hypertension. So our first level of defense against movement dysfunction and movement dysfunction complicated with pain, Mm -hmm. is our screening process. Our screening process stops the minute a movement pattern evokes pain. Let's say, you know, our our functional movement screen is actually quite simple, Mm -hmm. and you can either have a seven-point movement screen administered by an exercise professional, or, believe it or not, you can administer a Mm self-screen to yourself. And if you go to uh, YouTube and put in Gray Cook, self-movement screen, I'll actually demonstrate uh, for you a a self-movement screen. But my whole point is, either way, whether whether we see movement produces pain in a formal, professionally done screen, or you do it in a self-screen, it tells us that you do have a movement-related problem, but it still doesn't diagnose the problem. Now, that does not mean that you can't use some sound advice and, and thorough exercise practices. The one thing I will tell you, whatever movement pattern produced the pain, mm-hmm. do not exercise in that pattern. Mm-hmm. There's too many things going on. I don't know whether poor movement is causing the pain mm-hmm. or pain is causing distortion and say your coordination and motor control. Yeah. However, we will also identify movement issues that aren't complicated by pain. Mm-hmm. but we will all agree, agree are significantly deficient. Mm-hmm. Work on your deficient patterns, not your painful patterns. Because right. we've got quite a bit of research now showing that when you exercise in a pattern that has pain involved, mm-hmm. it distorts your ability to motor learn. 
and your responses to a painful pattern mm -hmm. are both inconsistent and unpredictable. So all of your motor learning resources stop. They flatline in a yeah. painful pattern. Mm -hmm. So let's say squatting hurts your back, yeah. but um, we find that when you lay on your back and say just do a leg raise, you're unbelievably restricted, but mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. I would say work on that pattern and avoid the squatting pattern. An even higher level way to really attack this in an aggressive manner mm -hmm. is coordinate your efforts with a medical professional and get the situation diagnosed. It does not mean you need to stop training. What it means is if we diagnose the source of back pain mm -hmm. through radiological findings, we can find out if this is largely a joint degeneration issue, if this is a neural irritation issue, if this is something that can be managed with aggressive soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's always an advantage by getting a diagnosis. And I think the reason a lot of people aren't willing to do that these days is my critique is of the medical profession. We have, we have largely considered back pain mm -hmm. as a diagnosis, not as a symptom. And, that, and that's, that's irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Back pain gets you in my door. You leave with a thorough understanding of where it's coming from. And, so. if, and if you come in my office and I say, yep, you've got low back pain, we're going to throw a little heat here, we're going to throw a little ultrasound there, and I'm going to crack you here and stretch you there, mm -hmm. I still haven't haven't encapsulated the problem. So, you know, I've raised the bar in the exercise profession by asking exercise professionals to screen before they exercise. But mm -hmm. I've also made quite a few medical professionals uncomfortable and said, your diagnostic skills are not good. I don't wait for an MRI to tell me what's wrong with you. I wait for the MRI to confirm what I suspect. So, and that's a completely different operational standpoint. So number one, mm -hmm. if you've got long-standing low back pain, and your best efforts to exercise haven't resolved it, just involve a medical professional, but don't stop training. Uh, just sure. get their advice and get some set advice. But secondly, don't exercise in the direction of pain. However, map out your dysfunctions and mm -hmm. attack those vigorously if they're not complicated by pain. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with stretching. Good old-fashioned stretching makes a difference. The reason conventional methods of stretching don't seem to have a long-lasting effect mm -hmm. is because after, after stretching, and I think you, you probably have experienced this too, there's a window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's about 30 minutes of greater extensibility yeah. that you have. Mm -hmm. And if you don't exploit and use that extensibility, then you default back to your previous operational uh, platform. Mm -hmm. So if you have a really weak core, yeah. then one of the ways you compensate is to increase the tightness and tone in your hamstrings. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is, the minute you appreciate a, a warm-up effect and a lengthening of your hamstrings, if we don't do a drill mm -hmm. that also makes you be a little bit quicker and a little bit more stable in your core, your brain has no option but to default back to tight hamstrings because I've got to keep your pelvis somewhat level when you walk. And yeah. if your abs won't do it, believe it or not, biomechanically your hamstrings will, will try. They're not in the most advantageous position to do so. Mm -hmm. But in the absence of any other help, they will. And that's that's how we were designed uh, to survive. There, compensation is always an option for survival, yeah. but it's not an optimal way to, to train or, or reinforce that. So what I would say is, you know, the, the efforts at flexibility, mm -hmm. if they make a, what I call um, a response as a temporary change and an adaptation is a longstanding change. If your stretching is at least effective enough to make a response, an appreciable temporary change, mm -hmm. then immediately follow that up with a usage. And, and, and here's one thing I tell people. If you're the person who doesn't have a lot of hamstring or hip mobility mm -hmm. and you then do something to improve that, I, I absolutely love variations of deadlifting. Number one, if I roll a three-year-old a medicine ball, 
they're not going to squat it, and they're not going to go down in a split stance and get it. They're going to deadlift that thing if they want to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, both for young clients, older clients, uh, poorly trained clients, the deadlift is an amazing option because it's a very primitive form of lifting. Yeah. It reinforces core stability mm -hmm. and makes you exploit your hip mobility. And sure. secondly, it doesn't load the shoulders in an awkward position, mm -hmm. and the increased tension you get with deadlifting is really good for uh, juicing a hormonal response and creating better bone density in older people. So, you know, I've told people, get, get the hamstring mobility acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's laying flat on your back and lifting one leg to 75, 80 degrees while the other leg remains flat. That's, that's acceptable. Get both legs symmetrical. Bend over and pick something up. And yeah. then do it with a little bit of guidance without changing your back position. And let's say you can't get something like a kettlebell that's placed between your ankles uh, off the floor without rounding your back. Mm -hmm. Then, for God's sakes, lift the kettlebell, but don't make it lighter and round your back to get to it. I would rather you see a lift a respectably heavy weight mm -hmm. with a range of motion uh, assistance than mm -hmm. to make it light and do it wrong. And I think that's where a lot of uh, trainers, you know, have inadvertently maybe made a little bit of a mistake, and it's a forgivable mistake, but when somebody has poor form, mm -hmm. don't go light. Assume yeah. that they don't have adequate capacity to do it, and in something like a deadlift, doing it in a partial range of motion is not uh, a disadvantage, whereas I think partial squats could largely distort your authentic motor program. A mm -hmm. partial deadlift does not load your joints unnecessarily, but it loads your soft tissue quite well. So the, the advice for the person at home is do your flexibility, and, and there's great flexibility information out there, but when you get it, use it before you lose it. You've got about a 30-minute window, yeah. and we actually designed a, a DVD called Kettlebells from the Ground Up mm -hmm. that explores a 300-year-old exercise called the Turkish Get Up. It is both a DVD, a two-DVD set, and a manual that's designed both for the exercise professional and the home user. We give a little extra information for the exercise pro, and in the manual, it's printed in red. But any person could load that DVD, grab a moderate to light kettlebell, turn on their TV set, and actually every position the Turkish getup gives them a challenge in, Mm -hmm. they can default to three corrective maneuvers that both improve their mobility and juice their stability. And, you know, I, I, I uh, sort of loosely say I think that uh, uh, exercise like the Turkish get-up that's, that's as old as it is, uh, over 300 years from our research, yeah. was probably not introduced as an exercise. It was probably introduced as a screen by old-world coaches and, and strongmen and said, if you can't do this, Mm -hmm. and you can't do it equally on each side, then I will not teach you to lift heavy things. Sure. And that's the definition of a screen. I'll be a smartass here, yes. Uh, but let me clarify that. Um, we have found that the best way to change a faulty movement pattern is not just with movement prep at the front or back of an exercise session, mm -hmm. but let's say uh, I have found a serious mobility issue in the way you lunge. Mm -hmm. You just, you really round your low back, you, you don't use your hips, you don't use your, your rotation in your upper back, and you just, your lunges are very, very uh, wanting for better form. Mm -hmm. Then we literally would warm you up with, with some stretching. Yeah. And uh, then we would go into a lunging activity, so you would build on the, the, the gain that you made. We would immediately superset another stretch for the same stretch before we did another loaded cycle. So, you know, we don't just look at mobility uh, or stability as this thing that occurs uh, or gets juiced up in your warm-up. We realize that bad movement is a behavior. And the best way to break a bad behavior is to constantly challenge it. Mm -hmm. So every time you do it wrong, we've got something that basically removes the barrier. So if I superset a corrective maneuver mm 
mm-hmm. between each of your conditioning maneuvers, then as you're trying to get stronger in your lunging pattern, your quality is consistently challenged throughout the workout, mm-hmm. just like your quantity is. And so we've said in the, in the, in the most important movement dysfunction situations, don't just lean on your warm-up or your cool-down. Mm-hmm. Superset a, a corrective maneuver with a conditioning maneuver. And a lot of people say, well, that's going to cut into my exercise. Believe it or not, it won't. Because here's what happens. When you increase your mobility, yeah. you can't lean on your stiffness anymore. And it requires a significantly greater amount of coordination mm-hmm. and motor control. So you're going to feel sloppy as hell when you do your next set of lunges. Mm-hmm. You may even have to go down in weight in your walking lunges. And mm-hmm. I have no problem with that at all because at least it's authentic and at least you're using motor control mm-hmm. to balance and lift the weight instead of your inherent stiffness. So the way I see it is we're going to remove some stiffness, which used to be a crutch. It wouldn't be there if you didn't use it mm-hmm. somehow. Sure. So we're going to remove some of your stiffness and then exploit that at your level of competence, mm-hmm. and then you're going to basically have to do something else. You can't lean on your stiffness, so you're going to have to basically acquisition some more motor control. It's going to be taxing, even if you got to go down and wait and go down in reps. But then you're going to immediately go and open up some more mobility. So you may find yourself temporarily going down in quantity mm-hmm. to make a qualitative change. But I think the, the whole supersetting your corrective with your conditioning is probably the quickest way to make a change. And so I put this to the test. In, in, in a professional sports situation where we've really got to get a guy moving better in a short amount of time, mm-hmm. the warm-up and the cool-down is not adequate. But supersetting a corrected maneuver right up against a conditioning maneuver is about the quickest way to really, really change movement. Yeah, no, I, I would I would appreciate that because believe it or not, uh, this this summer with uh, the company called Perform Better, I'm doing a pre-conference uh, symposium, mm-hmm. and one of the things I'm attacking is what is our definition of functional exercise, and I'm actually going to uh, turn on the cameras and, and videotape that at the end of this summer in Long Beach, so we'll actually have a sort of a, a documentary on exploring this function, and I think it's it's a hard thing to define. I can fill up a room with 150 exercise professionals and medical or rehabilitation professionals Mm -hmm. and ask for a definition of function. And I can't get a consistent statement, which tells me that um, we got a little problem here. And if we were basically sitting on the steps of the gymnasium in the afternoon in ancient Greece and the philosophers were to show up and say, listen, if you're having a problem defining a term, Let's go in a 180-degree different direction and see if you can define its opposite. Mm -hmm. So let's define dysfunction first. And if I had to define dysfunction for you and your listeners right now, it would be a state of movement that puts you at risk for injury and or reduces your natural ability to adapt Mm -hmm. to new environments. And if you move so poorly, that you're at risk for injury, even under the supervision of an exercise professional, mm-hmm. or you move so poorly that you can't learn a new maneuver in a reasonable amount of time, then I'm not saying you have a medical problem, but I'm, dis- I'm saying you're stuck in a state of dysfunction. So that means even if you purchase P90X, or even if you buy a treadmill or a Nordic track, or even if you join a yoga class, you're not going to have the same benefits as the other participants and or you may actually get injured in the process. And it ain't the fault of the instructor or the product. You weren't ready for what you put your body through. So I think if we can define dysfunction, then we would consider function the absence of that. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to talk about functional exercise. I think functional exercise are those exercises that have a huge carryover effect. Mm -hmm. If you told me you did this one exercise, you felt that your posture during the workday was better. 
that you increased your uh, hiking capacity with a backpack by 30%. Mm-hmm. You enjoyed your runs more, and you also felt that you were a little bit crisper on your tennis serve. Yeah. Then I would say that the exercise, whatever it was, had quite a bit of carryover. Mm-hmm. Not only did it benefit you in the individual session of energy expenditure, but it also had a significant amount of carryover value into the other movement activities that you did. Compare mm-hmm. that mysterious exercise with a bench press. Mm-hmm. You can do a lot of bench press, and the one thing that I can guarantee will happen is your bench press will get better. I don't know if you'll be able to wash your back mm-hmm. or, or serve a tennis ball harder or paddle your kayak any faster, but I do know if you focus on it, your bench press will consistently get better. So many exercises don't have tangible benefit outside of their own individual slice of movement. Yeah. And then some actually do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think when we see more holistic approaches of exercise that involve triplanar movement, mm-hmm. they're functional. Sure. The, the criticism of functional exercise is, does it get you stronger? Functional mm-hmm. exercise keeps you moving. Yeah. Bending over and picking up something really, really heavy gets you stronger. Mm-hmm. And what you've got to do is choose your goals. If you really need to get stronger, I would say you've got to do moves that have been proven to get you stronger. But make sure the strength doesn't ask you to give up flexibility in the process. Sure. Or your pursuit of flexibility doesn't undermine your strength in the process. Mm-hmm. I think functional exercise helps you slowly gain your mobility without giving up your coordination or strength. Yes. And it helps you gain coordination and strength without having to give up your flexibility in the process. So, mm-hmm. so I'm not trying to be loose with the definition, but one of the things I did in, in my new book titled Movement is I, in the middle of the book, I listed some uh, self-limiting exercises. And the definition of a self-limiting exercise is an exercise mm-hmm. that demands that your integrity and your technical precision be at a certain level. Yeah. Let's take barefoot running, for instance. A lot of people got on this barefoot running or minimalist shoe running kick, mm-hmm. and they went out and did a 5K their first day without shoes. Yeah. Well, the gradient was too hot. It doesn't mean barefoot running is doesn't have a, a very good place mm-hmm. in, in the running community. It means that you overdosed the situation. Yeah. Barefoot running is self-limiting because you are not protected from your uh, mistakes. Mm-hmm. If you make a mistake barefoot running, if you heel strike, you immediately have discomfort and you quickly adjust mm-hmm. the activity so that you don't have discomfort. Mm-hmm. That adjustment may mean you shorten your stride and you slow down your cadence mm-hmm. or you sped up your cadence. Yeah. In doing that, barefoot running became comfortable, but now you're like, wait, I'm way off my time. Mm-hmm. Well, actually you're not. That's as fast as you can run barefoot with integrity. Yeah. If you take a kettlebell and invert it so it's bottom up and use your grip strength to press it overhead, mm-hmm. now your shoulder press is not limited by the strength of your shoulder. It's limited by your grip strength, your alignment, your connection, and your posture because you've got to balance that kettlebell, not just lug it up over your head. Mm-hmm. So what I did is I created a list of self-limiting exercises that – won't let you participate in a volume Mm -hmm. that will undermine or actually injure you because it's dependent not on your weight or your physical capacity or your endurance. It's limited by your technical precision. Now, our grandfathers, every exercise they did was Mm self-limiting because we hadn't invented the big cushy heel running shoes and we didn't have exercise machines for them. If they wanted to pick something up, They had to use good body mechanics. And if they wanted to take a run, they couldn't have sloppy form and Mm -hmm. lean on the cushioning of the shoe. They had to use their inherent structure and function to overcome the obstacle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our grandfathers participated in self-limiting and by default functional exercise without knowing it. Since we've created so much supplementation with Mm -hmm. seated fixed access exercise devices, isolated training, and, and even shoes or footwear that allow you to run 
far farther than your integrity will carry you, mm -hmm. we've created a whole new category of medical problems that are self-induced. And I think that, again, another thing, as you were talking, another thing popped into my head. You can talk about it in the same way with, with diet. A lot of people go on about the volume of food that they need to eat or the volume of exercise that they need to do, but they, they forget the, the quality. So it's, they're, they're looking for quali uh, quantity over quality, whereas, I, I suppose I use myself as the example, I'm trying to pull people off the, qu off the quantity for the time being and say, get the quality right, then build the quantity on top of it. And I guess you can sort of fit that in, in movement, you can fit that into exercise, and you can fit that into, into diet, which is, you know, all the different parts of, of, of sort of exercise and health and fitness, I guess. You know, and, and just to continue it a, a step further, because uh, we're on a good path, I, I look at exercise as an exercise in economy. See, economy's got nothing to do with money or finance. Economy mm -hmm. is the management of scarce resources. Mm -hmm. You can apply it to money, but we could also apply it to your and my exercise time or even a client's allocation of exercise time. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you. I got three kids. Yeah. One's in diapers and one's getting ready to go off to college. Yeah. I also have four companies. <laughs> yeah. If I'm, I'm lucky to literally exercise twice a week. Yeah. So you get to a point in life where you realize, you know what? I wonder how many of the exercises I'm doing aren't even responsible for my level of fitness. And I wonder how many are absolutely responsible for my level of fitness. And so mm -hmm. you almost get back to that 80-20 rule, knowing that 80% of what you got is due to about 20% of your effort. It's a rule in economy. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that, that I really want to help trainers do, and I really want to help the, 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 the self-help client do or the self-trained athlete do, mm -hmm. is if something's not benefiting you, I want to give you the authority to yeah. systematically delete that. Mm -hmm. And in doing that mm -hmm. is where I freed up the time for you to invest the extra effort in what I'm asking you to do. And so many people say, like, you know, you've got a lot of great corrective ideas, but I don't have time mm -hmm. in my workout to inject all those. I, I believe what you're saying, yeah. but I don't have the time to do it. And I'm like, if you delete the unnecessary maneuvers that have absolutely have no effect yeah. on your physical development or mm -hmm. your physical performance, yeah. then believe it or not, yeah. not only can you delete those and free up some time for corrective, you could probably delete one workout a week mm. and maintain your fitness. If you want to advance your fitness, add a workout a week. But believe it or not, I go in maintenance phase three months, every three months, because my lecture and my travel, I'm stuck in a hotel room. Yeah. But I think we can all, in an imperfect world, in an imperfect situation, maintain a very respectable level of fitness if mm -hmm. we practice economy and time management. And you can't do that without every now and then doing a survey of what's working and what's not working, which is why I'm such an advocate of you know, get yourself screened and, 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 and find out if what you're doing is really making a difference. Because, you know, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. We bring denial to our exercise every day. And so injecting a small dose of objectivity yeah. of, of sort of logic or medical objectivity into our exercise assumptions is mm -hmm. a healthy thing to do. I mean, we've been talking a lot about functional exercise and functional movement, and we, we may have already sort of answered this question but I just want to sort of say the question anyway because it'd be nice to get it in in sort of a, a concise way we may have in the last sort of five or ten minutes that we've been talking just sort of amalgamated an answer throughout the ten minutes but just to get a nice concise answer why is functional exercise so beneficial for our body I think it's the closest thing to an authentic diet we we weren't made to exercise mm -hmm. we were made to uh, run around and gather food and hunt things down and defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. And those environments are different every day, yeah. and they require adaptability. Mm -hmm. Functional exercise forces us 
into adaptability if it's practiced correctly. Yeah. Whereas if your bench and your weight and your clipboard and your exercise partner is the same every Tuesday and Thursday, mm-hmm. it's very easy to become a one-trick pony. Yeah. That's not why we're here on this planet. Our adaptability, not our intelligence, is the only reason we're still on this planet. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, things that force you to adapt mm-hmm. are functional. So coming off a hard set of squats and then walking across a 30-foot balance beam, believe it or not, is more functional than just walking the balance beam or doing the squats because it requires you to be strong but then graceful in the same 10-minute package, Mm -hmm. which means, you know, just because you gain your thigh and hip strength doesn't mean you can give up your foot and ankle sensitivity. And so, you know, uh, there's so many different ways to package functional exercise that that I think it should be practiced. And and so, yeah, I migrate to the kettlebell Mm -hmm. just because it was literally one of the first weightlifting apparatuses. It preceded the dumbbell and the the, the, the straight bar weight yeah. a good hundred years in many cases. And the Turkish get up is a great example of that. Mm. And oh, the sun salutation is a great example of just maintaining those attributes that keep us functional. Walking on a balance beam keeps us functional. Standing up on a paddleboard, propelling yourself forward and not falling off the paddleboard is, is unbelievably self-limiting and functional. Barefoot mm-hmm. running is is functional doing a bottom-up kettlebell press is functional pressing something overhead and balancing yourself and squatting down Mm -hmm. is functional because it pushes you up against your mobility and your stability limits at the same time Mm -hmm. now people say well how much load do you do only do what you can do it's not this we we we're not about maximal loads anymore we're about maximal precision maximal balance maximal integrity you know. Now let me let me throw one other thing in there. When you movement screen and find a deficiency, mm-hmm. there's there's two ways you could approach it. You yeah. could either inject more functional exercise. Mm-hmm. which is just basically like adopting a healthier diet, yeah. or you could specifically target the deficiency. Mm-hmm. So let's let's compare it to nutrition. If we found, Chris, that you were deficient in vitamin D, mm-hmm. we could basically say, hey, add more vitamin D-rich foods to your diet, or we could temporarily supplement vitamin D to really make a aggressive, very, very uh, proper change. Mm -hmm. So the difference in functional exercise and corrective exercise isn't necessarily the move that you do. Mm -hmm. It's the baseline that you set and the deficiency that you identify. So Mm -hmm. functional exercise is like simply adding more holistic uh, practices to your diet. Corrective exercise Mm -hmm. is the off-growth of movement screening and movement assessment where you specifically and reliably and objectively identify a deficiency mm-hmm. and temporarily inject a specific functional move targeted directly at hip mobility, ankle mobility, core stability, shoulder stability. So corrective exercise and functional exercise look very much the same, mm-hmm. but we have tighter criteria and a much better baseline for corrective exercise. So you could almost say corrective exercise is a temporary supplement mm-hmm. that, that really gets you out of dysfunction fast. Once yeah. you're out of dysfunction, learn from your mistake and adopt a more functional platform in your workout mm-hmm. and remove the need for supplementation. So I think a lot of people confuse the terms corrective exercise and functional exercise because they, they look a lot the same. They use the same equipment. They have the same movement patterns. Corrective exercise not be practiced if yeah. you don't identify a deficiency first, which sure. is why screening is, is in our in our wheelhouse.
Well, unfortunately, you know, mainstream exercise has had a, a significantly Western influence. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, Western, uh, is not always (laughs) good. You know, uh, we have some, we have some nice medical advances, but we also invented Coca-Cola and McDonald's. So (laughs) (laughs) we're, we're partly, yeah, we're partly to blame for a lot of the problems that we're, we're learning to cure Mm -hmm. if, if, if that's okay to say. And, and, what I want people to understand is in the 1970s and 80s, exercise uh, was l- very much influenced by bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Now, bodybuilding is literally the art of sculpting your body mm-hmm. into the most aesthetically pleasing statue that you could do. Yeah. Bodybuilders aren't graded on their movement. They're graded on their muscle hypertrophy and their symmetry. Mm-hmm. And they have come up with some unbelievably effective ways at at improving the the, the shape of the body. Mm-hmm. It it would be it would be incorrect to assume that improving the shape of the body always improves the function of the body. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that gymnasts and pro athletes don't have aesthetically pleasing bodies, but these bodies aren't nearly as pumped up or puffed up mm-hmm. as the is the bodybuilders that we saw from, you know, the, the, the late seventies, the eighties up through to today. So training movement as a gymnast would, or a fighter would, or a football player would, will yeah. definitely give you an aesthetically pleasing body. Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of work to get there. And the body doesn't develop its muscularity through isolation. It develops, develops it through functional patterns that you were designed to do. Mm-hmm. If, if you are very dissatisfied with a certain body part and literally want to change the shape of that body part, then obviously you'll wind up more in a bodybuilding, you know, isolation mentality. Yeah. But the problem is, I think what happened was there was so much of this subconscious influence of, of bodybuilding mm-hmm. in personal fitness mm-hmm. that the personal fitness instructor... Uh, the, the personal trainer and even the strength coach thought that their job was to change shape mm-hmm. of the body, mm-hmm. not realizing that if you focus on function, not only will you change body composition, but you will definitely change muscularity, but at no time will you sacrifice movement yeah. in that endeavor. Mm-hmm. So, so if you want a body build, I think the bodybuilders have proven that the best way to get there is to isolate and train Mm-hmm. And hypertrophy your deficient areas. Absolutely. But if you want to look, if you want to look really sexy within normal reasons and move really, really well, mm-hmm. it's almost better if you do your workout and never mention a single muscle group. There's no sure. such thing as bicep day or you know Tuesday's International Leg Day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anymore. Well, it's it doesn't mean that you can't break up your workout and say make uh, Tuesday a a pull day. Yeah. Thursday a push day, or or make Monday when you're fresh and coming off three days of rest a plyometric and 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 sort of a low rep day, and mm-hmm. then make Wednesday a recovery day or something like that. Yeah. But I really think that that you know since most of us don't specialize, most of us aren't professional quarterbacks or kickers or golfers. Mm-hmm. We don't throw the javelin for a living. There's no reason to really hone in your training on a specific pattern. I think I think what we've learned is if we want to look respectable at age seventy, mm-hmm. I think we should look at the people who are age seventy and look really good right now. And I think sometimes you see some seventy-year-olds that have practiced uh, moderate amounts of yoga, running, and martial arts. They look mm-hmm. damn good. Yeah. And you see some a seventy-year-old that's practiced, you know, powerlifting or bodybuilding, mm-hmm. and God bless them. They were they were. They were the shit in their day, yeah. but they can't even touch their toes now, and they need help putting their pants on. And yes. so, you know, I think, you know, fitness across the lifespan doesn't become important mm. until, until you get on the other side of your glory days, and then it becomes the most important thing in your life. And so practicing with the end in mind, the way you want to look when you're 70, yeah. has to be important. Now. Sure. I also work with people who compete in the Olympics and people who are professional athletes. Mm-hmm. 
And we all realize that they've got to specialize. And some of the things that we do to help them specialize in their endeavor right now may help them be functionally fit for their specialized sport, yeah. but may at the same time compromise their immediate health. We sure. know that movement asymmetries are very present in uh, athletes that do things to one side more than the other. Mm-hmm. And for a temporary amount of time between your 20s and 30s, I think that's okay. But yeah. once, once you get off that track, mm. I think the, the, the uh, philosophical sages of all time would say, you know, balance in every endeavor, moderation in every endeavor is the way we go. That doesn't sure. mean you shouldn't seek strength and flexibility. You should seek them equally. You know, there there's some positions that we can put our bodies in mm-hmm. that really challenge the sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. And and you and I talk about that whole neural developmental sequence where babies always roll before they crawl. Yeah. And they crawl before they, you know, get into kneeling. Well, we don't really get out on a knee very often anymore unless we're unless we're saying a prayer or we just scored a goal or a touchdown. You don't really see many people in modern life get out on one knee, but Mm-hmm. There's an entire group of exercises called the chop and lift. Yeah. And that's either going down on both knees or going down on one knee. Now, what this does is by bending your knee and taking a knee, you disadvantage your quads. And mm-hmm. for some reason in modern culture, in modern fitness culture, we see a lot of people become what we call quad dominant. Their quads are really strong, but it's their glutes and their core yeah. that are seem to be deficient. Mm-hmm. So um, I've written four articles on chopping and lifting and yep. why they're so beneficial to inject into your normal routine. And, uh, uh you know, if, if, if you can't find these, Melissa can definitely help you post these because they're free to everybody. They're four PDF articles on chopping and lifting. Cool. I also did one on, uh, maintain your squat, train your deadlift, meaning it's important to work on the flexibility of your squat. But some of us, if we load our squat because of our deficiencies, our poor mechanics, our previous mileage and issues, mm-hmm. it's going to get worse. So if you work on the flexibility and moderate strengthening of your squat, but you really push the training of your deadlift, mm-hmm. it's going to improve both. So there's, those are two very, very functional paths that I've, I've put quite a few people on. And I don't know if you're have seen the work of Tim Ferriss. He uh, wrote the four hour work week and then yeah. turned around and wrote a book called the four hour body. He yeah. called me from South Africa when he was writing one of his book chapters in the four hour body and said, listen, I know you're the movement screen guy, but I'm in South Africa and you're in Virginia. You can't screen me. I bet you already know what exercises would make me more functional right away. And I said, actually I do, but that's, that's not really something I want to promote. I really think each person should take a little time to get screened because it's what we don't want to find mm-hmm. that might help you. But anyway, just because you're challenging me and, and I'm a guy and you're a guy, we both did through the RKC and I see you throwing, you know, putting a line in the sand or throwing down a sword. I'll do that. Here's the deal. You need to do chops. You need to do lifts. You need to do single leg deadlifts and you need to do the Turkish get up and you need to own these movements. Don't just struggle through them and don't tell me how much you're lifting. If you send me a video and every one of your posture points isn't spot on, I'm going to whack you with a bamboo cane. So what I'm saying is I'm giving you these exercises not to see how strong you are, but how tight your technique is. Mm -hmm. If you practice tight technique in each of these movements, the chop, the lift, the single leg deadlift, and the Turkish getup, you're going to experience difficulty when the left knee is down or when you're doing a Turkish get-up with your right hand or a single leg deadlift with your left leg down. Mm-hmm. When you experience the difficulty, don't gut it out. Own the movement. Practice precision. Go down in weight. Get your precision up. Go back up in weight. Practice these moves for symmetry. Yeah. And if you want to if you want to read more about this, I mean, Tim put it in this whole book chapter, and I was honored by the fact that he, he said this is the longest and probably most important chapter in the book. But what happened was Tim, Tim practiced these moves. 
Yeah. Because I set him up for a self-limiting situation. So even though I couldn't screen him, mm -hmm. I, I ran him through a movement gauntlet that would catch his compromised mobility, flexibility, stability, strength, whatever. Yeah. He called me a few times. I tightened him up on his technique. But we did the entire thing through the same articles I told you to look at and phone conversations. When he got back to the States, he said, do you know somebody in New York that could take me through a movement screen? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I know uh, Eric Dugatti. He's, he's right out of New York and New Jersey. He actually works with the New York Giants, the football team, on movement screening. He'd be glad to screen you if you can get over to his office. And Tim Ferriss scored an 18 on the movement screen, which is six points higher than the NFL combine average of college-age guys going to play pro football. Sure. So simply by practicing these exercises – for precision, yeah. not volume. Mm -hmm. He was able to achieve an unbelievably respectable movement screen, and he commented in that book chapter, he felt probably more aligned and strong than he's ever felt in his life. So, you know, that's, that's the thing I want people to know. It's not how many exercises you do, mm -hmm. it's how well you own the yeah. exercises you practice. So if somebody were to show up and do a magazine article on your workout one day, yeah. You'd never be ashamed of the photographs and the art. No, Chris, I, I, first of all, I really appreciate it. And I, I really appreciate the way you ask questions because it, it allows me to know that you have at least looked at the work and, and that you're, you're not, you're not, you know, just benefiting from the paradigm shift uh, in fitness. You're actually part of it. Sure. Um, let me give you some action points for uh, fitness professionals, mm -hmm. first of all. Uh, whether you take a functional movement screening course or you download our online functional movement screening program, mm -hmm. you get certified either way. Sure. We've got fi quite a few pieces of information for the exercise professional. Mm -hmm. I wrote a textbook that can be downloaded as an e-version or purchased as either a hardback or softback and it's called Movement, Functional Movement Systems. Mm -hmm. I've got a live lecture where I actually show people how to work the model and develop uh, exercise programs based on this movement profile, and it's called Applying the Model. And you can see both of these uh, products, the, the textbook and the, the DVD, on the website. They're both available in both hard copy and download. The home study course is a great way for somebody to get certified in movement screening and actually advertise the fact that you're certified in movement screening and, and benefit from a lot of the resources on our site. Just by getting movement screened, you're an instant member of our website and have access to our exercise library and, and, and much of our work. Cool. If you're self-training mm -hmm. and, and you like what I've said, but you're not interested in working anybody else, you're interested in dialing it in for you, the very first book I ever wrote was called Athletic Body and Balance. Mm -hmm. And you can also find it on our website and find it on Amazon. And I speak directly to the to this self-trained person and give you an opportunity to do a self-movement screen. And based on what you find in that self-movement screen, there's a program in that book that will sort of dial you in. Mm -hmm. If you just want to get a sample of that and don't want to swipe your credit card, go to, go to YouTube right now and put in Gray Cook self-movement screen and you can watch an 11 minute video of exactly what a self-screen looks like and what you should do with the information. Cool. Every product on our website that mm -hmm. involves a kettlebell mm -hmm. or an Indian club is both user-friendly for the exercise professional and consumer. Mm -hmm. The other DVDs and, and videos on our site are more geared toward the exercise professional, but if it involves a kettlebell or an Indian club, yeah. It is designed for everyone. So I hope that, that you know, both your, your listeners who are there for some self-help advice and your, your exercise pros have both found some, some value in that. And if they go to our website, if they'll sort of each go for those products that I mentioned would more suit their needs, mm -hmm. I think that uh, they would definitely uh, benefit.